Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today on this first Sunday of Advent, I'm preaching from the book of Luke, the 21st chapter, verses 25 through 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this world. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Was the beginning of Advent, and all through the church, our hope was all dying. We've given up the search. It wasn't so much that Christ wasn't invited, but after 2,000 plus years, we are no longer excited. Oh, we knew what was coming, no doubt about that, and that was the trouble. It was all old hat. November brought the first of an unending series of pains with carefully orchestrated advertising campaigns. There were gadgets and dolls and all sorts of toys, enough to seduce even the most devout girls and boys. Unfortunately, it seemed no one was completely exempt from this seasonal virus that did all of us tempt. The priests and the prophets, and certainly the kings, were all so consumed with a desire for things. It was rare, if at all, that you would hear of the reason for the origin of this whole holy day season. A baby, it seems, once had been born in the Mideast somewhere on this first holy day morn. But what does that mean for folks like us? who've lost ourselves in the hoopla and fuss. Can we relearn the art of wondering and waiting, of hoping and praying and anticipating? Can we let go of all of the things and the stuff? Can we open our hands and our hearts long enough? Can we open our eyes and open our ears? Can we find him again after all of these years? Will this year be different from all the rest? Will we be able to offer him all of our best? So many questions unanswered thus far, as wise men seeking the home of the star. Where do we begin? How do we start to make for the child a place in our heart? Perhaps we begin by letting go of our limits on hope and of the stuff that we know. Let go of the shopping, of the chaos and fuss. Let go of the searching. Let Christmas find us. We open our hearts, our hands, and our eyes to see the King coming in our own neighbor's cries. We look without seeking what we think we've earned, but rather we're looking for relationships spurned. With him he brings wholeness and newness of life for brother and sister, for husband and wife. 
The Christ child comes not by our skill, but rather he comes by his own father's will. We can't make him come with parties and bright trees, but only by getting down on our knees. He'll come if we wait amidst our affliction, coming in spite of, not by our restriction. His coming will happen of this, there's no doubt. The question is whether we will be in or out. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you have the courage to peek through the lock? Basket on your porch, a child in your reach, a baby to love, to feed, and to teach. He'll grow in wisdom as God's only son. How far will we follow this radical one? He'll lead us to challenge the way that things are. He'll lead us to follow a single bright star. But that will come later if we're still around. The question for now is the child to be found. Can we block out commercials, the hype and the mails? Can we find solitude in the holy halls? Can we keep alert, keep hope, stay awake? Can we receive the child for ours and God's sake? From on high with the caroling host as he sees us, he yearns to read on our lips the prayer, Come Lord Jesus. As Advent begins, all these questions make plea. The only true answer, we will see, we will see. This is credited to Todd Jenkins. Starting the season of Advent by reading this Luke passage brings multiple contrasts into view. We have the signs in the sun, moon, and the stars, and the nations in anguish in verse 25 that will foreshadow the risen Jesus juxtaposed with the sign that is the infant Jesus in chapter 2, verse 12. Power and glory on the one hand in verse 27, humility and helplessness on the other, chapter 2, verse 7. A warning that people will faint from terror and the heavenly bodies be shaken in verse 26, set alongside a message of good news of great joy for all people in chapter 2, verse 10. As odd as it might seem to draw these contrasting images together, there is wisdom in it. The gospel is full of paradoxes. In Luke, the infant Jesus is more than a baby in a manger. He is also a savior who is Christ the Lord, chapter 2, verse 11, both infant and savior. Jesus teaches, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it, chapter 17, verse 33, both losing one's life and keeping it. He says to his disciples, Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Chapter 12, verse 51. Yet when he returns, he declares peace to you. Chapter 24, verse 36. Both division and peace. On a theological level, Christians affirm paradox all the time. Jesus' crucifixion led both to death and to new life. Jesus was both fully God and fully human. More is going on than meets the eye. Returning to Luke chapter 21, we find still more paradox in its apocalyptic language. Verses 16 and 17, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Destruction, death and betrayal are coming, but hope is there in the midst of it all. Verses 18 and 19, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will save yourselves. Earthly trials and tribulations are portrayed as temporary. And vindication for God's chosen ones is described as imminent. 
As Jesus taught his disciples in verse 28, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near, both suffering and comfort. Accepting Jesus as your Lord and Master does not guarantee you an easy life. Yes, you will be able to find joy in the midst of life's struggles and peace in times of uncertainty. The greatest challenge we face today is fear. I suspect that that's always been true. Why else is the most common command and promise in Scripture? Do not fear. More than 120 times across Old and New Testament, some angel or priest or prophet or an absolutely ordinary person says, usually on behalf of God, do not fear. While verse 26 tells us people are fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. In verse 28, Jesus tells his followers, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. As my friend likes to say, I don't have to fear anything because God's got this and he's got us. Amen.